With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. I heard about a preacher who was out of town to preach a revival. And a man from the church picked him up to take him over to the revival service. It wasn't the pastor, it was a church member. And when the preacher got in the car, the church member said, Preacher, we're looking forward to the revival starting tonight. Have you had a good day? And the preacher said, Well, I've not had a good day. My dentures broke a little while ago and I can't hardly talk. And the driver said, Well, that's, that's okay. I've actually got a bunch of sets of dentures where I work. We'll stop by on the way to the church and uh, we'll get you some dentures. And the preacher thought to himself, Man, what providence of God that the man who picked me up is obviously an orthodontist. And they pulled into the back of this real nice, beautiful brick building. And the driver got out and went inside and came back out with a set of dentures. The preacher put them in. He said, I don't think I'm preaching. Those oh, dentures are too big. He said, well, give them back to me. I'll go back in. He came back out with a second set of dentures. The preacher put them in his mouth. And he said, I don't think I could talk with those. Those dentures are way too small. They're way too tight. They're hurting my mouth. The man said, well, give them back to me. He went back in that nice building, came back out with a third set of dentures. The, the preacher put them in. He said, man, these are perfect. These feel like they were made just for me. What providence of God that the day that I break my dentures, I'm picked up to go to the revival meeting by an orthodontist. The man said, I'm not an orthodontist. I'm an undertaker. This is the funeral home. Well, truthfully, the only thing that's funny about an undertaker is when we make a joke about them. Because we don't like to talk about death unless we're being humorous. But the Apostle Paul is moved by the Spirit of God to deal firmly with the issue of death and the reality of life after death because of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you've been with us in this series, you know the Corinthians believed in the resurrection of Jesus because you can't be saved if you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They did not deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus, but they denied and misunderstood how the resurrection of Jesus would impact their own life, their own body, and their own eternal destiny. So the Apostle Paul is inspired by God to write about some simple truths because Jesus lives. And if you paid attention, you see here, he says, because he lives, you're going to live forever, either in heaven or hell. Which one that is will be determined either at the point of your death or at the victorious return of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, your knee will bow, your tongue will confess the lordship of Jesus. It's only a question of when, not if. These things are true because he lives. Now let's just move our way back through these three verses this morning. And I want you to notice, first of all, something about the raising of Christians. The first thing that is true because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the resurrection of all those who trust Jesus as Lord God and Savior. Now according to John chapter 5, which we'll look at in just a moment, the resurrection of Jesus actually guarantees the bodily resurrection of everyone. Christian and non-Christian alike. But this passage begins, first of all, by dealing with the resurrection of Christian dead. Now this ought to be a word of comfort for believers in the building today. If you have ever left the cold graveside of somebody that you know and love and you know they knew and loved Jesus, you walk away from that cemetery and you've got hurt in your heart, but you've got hope in your heart. There's a reason for that. Jesus lives. If you've ever stood at the hospital bed of someone and you kissed them on the cheek or on the forehead, knowing it'd be the last kiss in this earthly life, you walk away from that hospital room, your heart is broken, but your heart is also fixed on the hope of the life to come. You've got good reason to have that mixture of grief and glory. It's because Jesus Christ has been bodily raised from the dead. If you've ever held a hand by a hospice bed and you said, this isn't goodbye, this is just see you later, you base that bedrock assurance not on some nebulous, vague truth. You base that assurance on this glorious fact. Christ died on the cross for our sin. Christ was buried. Christ has been raised from the dead. And now we have the blessed hope that he who is the resurrection and the life will one day bring resurrection and life to our earthly physical bodies. Paul says we've got reason to hope because he lives. 
Now, the raising of Christians is based on two fundamental realities that we find in verses 20, 21, and 22. First of all, he mentions a word about the resurrection of the Lord. The resurrection of the Lord. This 15th chapter is one of two primary places in the Bible that we read about the resurrection of the Christian dead. Now, it is pictured and proclaimed in other places. But the two fundamental passages for this truth are found here in 1 Corinthians 15 and in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. In each of those cases, Paul connects the promised resurrection of Christian dead with the past resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is in the Thessalonian passage beginning in verse 13 of chapter 4 that Paul says, For I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which have fallen asleep. Listen to what he said. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Church, do you believe that? He said, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so will God bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. The resurrection of Christians in the future is fundamentally connected to the resurrection of Jesus in the past. This is why we love singing this new wonderful hymn that says, Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death the God of life, but no grave could e'er restrain him. Praise the Lord, he is alive. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. As surely as Jesus Christ got up out of that grave, one day the trumpet will sound the voice of the archangel and the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise. Why? Because of the resurrection of the Lord. Do you see it in verse 20? But now Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul is using an agricultural analogy that would have been well known to Jews that were receiving this letter. He's connecting the bodily resurrection of Jesus to the feast or the festival of first fruits. You can read about that in Leviticus chapter 23 as well as other places in the Old Testament. During the springtime harvest, particularly of grain, the Jews would bring that first sheaf, that first collection of grain. When the harvest first started coming in, they wouldn't eat of it. They would gather that first part of the harvest, the first fruits, and they would take it to the house of God and offer it as a gift of worship. It's sort of like when those first tomatoes come in, when that first okra comes in, when that first corn is ready to be broken and set upon the table. They would gather up that first harvest and they wouldn't take it to eat eat it themselves. They would give it as an offering to God. It was an expression of dependence. God, we're giving this first food, this first fruit to you with anticipation and dependence that some other food is going to come in. We're giving this gift to show you that we depend on you and everything we've got has come from your hand. And by the way, we give that first fruit offering every time we give from the first fruit of our increase and we bring a tithe and an offering to the Lord. Every time you put money in the offering plate or give online, it's a sign of a first fruits offering. God, I'm giving to you depending that you're going to bring in everything else that I need. It's worth noting that that first fruit offering was given by the Jews on the first day after the Sabbath in the week of the Passover. I don't have to remind you, that's the day that the women came to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus for his burial. But rather than finding a cold, dead carcass, they found the stone rolled away and some men dressed in white. And one of those angels asked them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, for he is risen. And now the Apostle Paul says the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ was a first fruit. That is, it was a first offering that pictures that more is to come. Jesus Christ is the first one to ever be raised from the dead like he was raised from the dead. 
Others had been raised from the dead before, but they eventually died again. But Jesus Christ is the first one ever to be resurrected, to never die again, to never taste death again, to live forever and forevermore. And because he's been raised from the dead, one day there's going to be a great harvest of Christian dead who arise from the grave never to taste death again. And it's all based on the resurrection of the Lord. John MacArthur writes about this truth on this passage and says the fact that Christ was the first fruits therefore indicates that something else, namely the harvest of the rest of the crop, is to follow. By the way, you're part of that crop if you know Jesus. In other words, Christ's resurrection could not have been in isolation from ours. His resurrection requires our resurrection For his resurrection was part of the larger resurrection of God's redeemed. Why does Paul teach about the raising of Christians? Well, it's first of all because of the resurrection of the Lord. But secondly, now in verses 21 and 22, he says something about the redemption of the lost. For since by a man came death, that's obviously speaking of Adam, falling into sin, and according to Romans chapter 5, sin entered the world by a man, And death came by way of sin. Here, verse 21, Paul says, By a man came death, by a man also, that is by another man, came the resurrection of the dead. So so one man brought death, another man brought life. Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. I mentioned earlier in this message, That the resurrection of Jesus guarantees the bodily resurrection of every person who has ever lived. Saved and lost. Jesus taught this truth in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John. Beginning in verse 25, look at what the Master said. "The, The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they that hear shall live. This is the words of Jesus, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, if I were in this building today and I did not know for a fact that Christ was my Savior, that Jesus was my Lord and my sins were forgiven, there'd be a question that would be burning down in my heart. I mean, it would be be burning down in my soul right now. How can I make sure that I'm a part of that resurrection unto life and not a part of that resurrection unto damnation? Well, here the Apostle Paul describes it really in genealogical terms. It depends on whose bloodline you're in. He says that some are in the line of Adam... And some are in the line or the lineage of Jesus Christ. How do you get in the line of Adam? Well, you didn't have anything to do with it. Your mama and daddy did that for you. Or should I say they did that to you? Because you were born into the line of Adam. When you were born... When they took you from your mama's womb, slapped you on your bottom, and you cried, and you started to breathe air, that moment you were birthed into and you were born into Adam's fallen race. For when Adam sinned against God, he plunged all of humanity under the curse and the stain of sin. That's why the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own wicked way. Paul said in Romans 3.23, We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 5, he says, After sin entered the world and death came by way of sin, now death has passed from Adam. Death has passed to all men, for all have sinned. You were born into the race of Adam, destined to be a part of the resurrection unto damnation. That's by your first birth. But the only way you get from the line of Adam into the line of Jesus is not by birth, but by rebirth. That's why when Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3 and asked how he could inherit eternal life, 
Jesus said, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. If you want to get into heaven, you must be born what? You must be born again. Because you see, your first birth birthed you into the line of Adam. But something's got to happen between that birth and your death or you will die like you were born under the damnation and judgment of God. So you're born into the line of what Paul calls the first Adam, but you can be born again into the line of the last Adam, the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. And that happens when you repent of your sin and place your faith where God puts your sin on the cross of Jesus Christ the Lord. All who are born are born into the line of Adam. But you've got to be born again to get into the line of Jesus. My first birth not only put me in the line of Adam, but it put me into the line of Duell and Mary Stone. But my second birth on a Sunday night as a child, I was, as the hymn writer says, born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine. I've been justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. As an adoptive parent, I've given a lot of thought through these last 16 years to the idea of adoption. I've thought a lot about the difference between a biological bloodline and a judicial decree. When I was born of the flesh from my parents, I was born into the line of Adam. But when I knelt at an altar of prayer, repented of my sin, and trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, my Heavenly Father, I'm talking about the God and Judge of all the ages, entered in an adoption decree on my behalf and said, You are no longer a son of Adam. You are a son of mine. You are no longer my enemy. You are my friend. You are no longer a stranger, an alien, or a pilgrim. You are now one of my children. I'm adopting you into my family. And because of that, one day I'm going to be raised from the dead to spend forever with God. That's based on the resurrection of the Lord and the redemption of the lost. And the question that ought to be burning on your heart today, has anything like that ever happened for me? Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Because He lives, Paul teaches about the raising of Christians. Secondly, he says a word about the return of Christ. For the bodily resurrection of Jesus guarantees the bodily return of Jesus. And here Paul connects the bodily resurrection of Christ with the bodily resurrection of all believers and says something very important. That these resurrections, plural, these resurrections will be activated by the bodily return of Jesus Christ. Notice with me, please, in verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that, those who are Christ at his coming. I fear that we have seen so many watercolored pictures and artist renderings of the second coming of Christ, maybe on a Christian greeting card. That we now relegate in our mind the second coming of Jesus Christ to a Saturday morning cartoon or a Sunday morning comic strip out of the paper. Simon Peter warns about this in 2 Peter chapter 3 and says that in the last days men will be mockers and scoffers of God and they will mock God saying, where is the promise of His coming? They will say the promise of His coming has been going on for a long, long time. He hadn't come yet as indication He's never going to come. But the apostle Peter said, you better not let this one fact escape you. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and the day of the Lord will come like a thief. That is, when you least expect it, Jesus Christ is going to split the eastern sky. Christ will come again and set in place a series of events, starting with the resurrection of the Christian dead and leading ultimately to the final eternal damnation of all those who reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. Because He lives... He's coming back. The raising of Christians, the return of Christ. Now when Christ returns, that will start in place a series of events beginning first of all with what I've called the happy resurrection of saints. Verse 23 again says, each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that, 
those who are Christ at His coming. Now, the return of Jesus Christ will be a literal, visible, physical return throughout the Bible. We learn that when He comes, every eye will see Him. We shall all behold Him, Jesus Christ the Lord. Now, how do we know that? Well, it's because a literal, physical Savior was born through the womb of the Virgin Mary. A literal, physical Savior walked on this earth in absolute sinless perfection. A literal, physical Savior died on the cross for the sins of all who would believe. A literal, physical Savior was placed in a literal, physical grave. A literal, physical Savior bodily rose from the dead. A literal, physical Savior appeared for 40 days with irrefutable and convincing proofs. A literal, physical Savior gathered with His disciples on what we call the Mount of Ascension. And I don't understand this, but I believe it because the Bible teaches it. A literal, physical Savior rose from the earth on a cloud and was received into heaven. Two men dressed in white looked at those early disciples and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the clouds, into the sky? This same Jesus who was taken away from you on a cloud into heaven. Listen, this same one, this literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus, this same one will come again in like manner. And the Bible teaches that this literal, physical Jesus ascended into heaven where he is even now seated at the right hand of God, from whence he will one day come to judge the living and the dead, those that are spiritually alive and those that are spiritually dead. One day Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth and He will put down the final judgment for all those who are saved and all those who are lost. It's going to be an actual, visible, literal, physical return. And it's going to be a happy, happy day for those who have died in Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 describes it this way. That the Lord Himself, that means not a committee, not an ambassador, no offense, Brother Lynn, but not an associate, not an angel, not some dead saint or patriarch, but the Lord Jesus Christ Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We used to sing those great songs like this one, On That Bright and Cloudless Morning. When the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of His resurrection share. When the saved of earth shall enter to their home beyond the skies. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Why? Because of the happy resurrection of the saints. When my granny Stone died, she was my first grandparent to die during my lifetime. My, my mama's daddy died before I was born, so I never met him. But I guess I was in my early 30s when Granny Stone died and I was privileged to be one of her three grandsons to speak at her funeral. Granny had kind of always enjoyed current events, politics. She, she followed some of that. So at her memorial service, it was the first time that I ever shared a story about Richard Nixon. You say, what does that have to do with your granny dying? Well, when Richard Nixon resigned in disgrace as the President of the United States right before he went to get on Marine One to go over to Andrews Air Force Base to take a disgraced trip back to California. Nixon met with his White House staff in the West Wing. And you may remember he looked at them and said a number of different things, but he, but he closed with this comment. He said, the English language doesn't have a real good word to tell you what I want to tell you, so I'm going to borrow a phrase from the French. And the president looked at his staff and said, Au revoir. We will meet again. I looked down at my granny's casket. I said, Granny, au revoir. Uh -huh. yeah. We will meet again. Yeah, that's right. that's right. Why? Because he lives. One day I'm going to live again as well and every born again blood bought believer will be living together with the Lord. You going to be part of that? Now there are two resurrections. There's the happy resurrection of saints. But this text also gives indication about the horrible resurrection of sinners. Verse 23 again, each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those are Christ that is coming. Then comes 
the end. That is, after Christ comes, soon will come the end when He, Jesus, hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when He has abolished all rule, all authority, and power. Verse 26 says that one of these enemies that will be put down, in fact, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now, I want you to do something. I'm being very, very serious. I know we've had a long weekend with many of our students and our student workers. I want you to look at your neighbor, give them a very kind nudge, give them an elbow, and make sure that they're awake and that they're listening to the preacher this morning. I'm serious. Do that right now. Because what I'm about to share will be perhaps the most important thing you've ever heard in your life. And it may very well be the most important thing you'll ever hear in all of your eternity. According to Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, on the day where Christ finally abolishes death, not just defeats death, but finally banishes and abolishes death forever, on that day, death and hell itself will be cast into the lake of fire. And on that day, Everyone whose name is not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. You say, preacher, I don't believe in hell. Then you don't believe in Jesus because Jesus taught about hell. That's right. And in Revelation chapter 20, the Bible talks about that day when death is finally abolished and banished forever. Here's how it's going to happen. You see, when a person dies, Christian or non-Christian alike, death is the separation of the spirit from the body. And whether you're saved or lost, death gets the body. Grave, the grave gets the body. So the physical body is taken by death. But the spirit, which is then separated from the body, either goes as a Christian into the presence of God. That's why the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But if you're not saved, the Bible teaches that death and the grave get your physical body, but hell receives your soul. And on that day of the resurrection of those that don't know Jesus, the sea will give up the dead that are in them, those that died and their body was lost at sea. Those who died upon the land, the Bible says that death will give up the dead that are in it. And hell will yield up the damned souls of those who had died without Christ. And their body and their soul will be reunited to stand before God. To stand before God the Son, Jesus Christ. To face their eternal judgment. And the Bible says that everyone at that judgment, their names not being found in the book of life, will be cast into the lake of fire. Again, I want to say very plainly today, if I were here and I did not know for a fact that Jesus was my Lord and Savior, I would want to know before I left this building, how can I be saved? Preacher, when I die, I want to ultimately take part in that first resurrection, that happy resurrection of the saints. I don't want to be a part of that horrible resurrection of sinners. Jesus describes his second coming in Matthew chapter 24. And he says, starting in the 37th verse, that the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in the days of before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. You don't have to be an expert Bible student to have heard the story of Noah's flood. For 12 decades, 120 years, Noah built the ark and preached the gospel. He said, God is angry with sin and judgment is coming, but he has provided a way of escape, but there's only one way, and that ark was a, an Old Testament picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be saved from the wrath to come if you'll get up under the grace of God and go God's way. But they didn't believe the old preacher. They laughed at him and mocked him. 
Nothing like what he was describing had ever happened before, so they wrongly assumed it will never happen in the future. And Jesus said they didn't understand what was going on until the flood came and took them all away, until it was eternally too late. And Jesus said, when I come back to this earth, it's going to be just like that. When I was a little boy, Six years old, I had some severe burns over my abdominal area. And that, that meant for several years I was in and out of doctor's offices, surgeon's offices. And in each and every one of those offices, there was a, there was a Bible book that was on the coffee table out in the waiting room. You've seen this at the doctor and the dentist's office before. It's called the, the Bible Story Book. And every doctor's office had volume one of that series. I think it was the one that the salesman brought by in hopes that they would buy the rest of the series. They all had that first one, which covered the events of the book of Genesis. As a child, I would sit there in each and every office, and I would turn and I would look at those pictures. There was a watercolor artist rendering of Eve being deceived. There was a watercolor picture of Cain offering fruits and vegetables to God. There would be a watercolor picture of the Tower of Babel. But in between all that was an artist's rendering of Noah's Ark. And in my childhood imagination, it looked like the, the flood had just started because there were still people alive in the water outside the ark. I would look at that and I would imagine the different circumstances of life that those people were in as a six-year-old boy. One was far away from the ark and it appeared to me that he'd probably been dog paddling and treading water about as long as he could. He had one of his hands cupped up to his mouth about like this and I could almost hear him screaming for someone to throw him a rope. There was another man in the waters of judgment and he was pictured up near the door of that ark and his hand was lifted with a clenched fist. I could almost hear him knocking on the door of that ark asking someone to let him in. But I'd learned as a boy in Sunday school that when Noah and his family entered into the ark, the finger of God shut the door. And I knew enough as a little boy to know that when the finger of God shut the door, it simultaneously sealed everybody on the inside on the inside and everybody on the outside on the outside. Because he lives, I wouldn't leave this building today unless I knew I'd repented of my sin and trusted Jesus. As my, I didn't ask if you were a church member. I didn't ask if you're a choir member. No offense to my staff, but I didn't ask if you work for this church. Young people, I didn't ask, are you trying to serve Jesus and, and, and got a t-shirt literally to prove it? I said, I wouldn't leave this building if I didn't know for a fact that Christ was my Savior and my sins were forgiven. Because he lives, one day there'll be the resurrection and the raising of Christians. There'll be the return of Christ. Thirdly and quickly, there's the reign over creation. In verses 24 through 28, the Apostle Paul quotes from Psalm 8 and verse 6, a messianic prophecy about the fact that one day the Messiah would rule and reign over all creation and all of his enemies would be placed under his feet. Now, in the interest of time and how I sense the Spirit of God moving in this service, I just want to very quickly tell you two things about the reign over creation. First of all, I want to say a word about the timing of His reign. The Word of God says in verse 24, Then comes the end, when He hands over the kingdom to God and the Father, when He has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Now what I want you to notice from this text is that Jesus Christ will not come until he comes to put down all power, all rule, and all authority. You see, for several centuries there has been a view of prophecy, a view about the second coming of Christ that is called post-millennialism. 
Now, the best Greek word for that is hogwash. What that view teaches is that life on earth is going to get better and better and better and better and better and better and better. And people are going to live more godly and more godly and more godly and more godly. That righteousness will increase. That holiness will begin to increase. And finally, things are going to be so good on the earth that Jesus says, Now that's the kind of place I want to go back to. That view necessarily pushes the potential of the return of Christ way out in the future somewhere because, listen, if you think that Christ isn't going to return until life on earth gets great, that's not going to happen anytime soon. The Word of God does not teach that. The Word of God actually says that things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until King Jesus comes and sets His foot down upon this earth and begins to rule and reign in righteousness and His kingdom will have no end. And if you realize Jesus is going to come when things are bad and not when things are great, that means He just flat might come today. Could I say it again? That's another reason. I wouldn't leave this building if I didn't know Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Because of the timing of His reign. Lastly, I want to say a quick word about the totality of His reign. There's a word the blessed Apostle Paul beats like a cheap drum in the closing verses of this passage. It's that little word, all. That Jesus is going to put all things under His feet. All of his enemies will be put in subjection. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why we often sing in this church that he shall return with power to reign. Heaven and earth will join to say, oh praise him, alleluia. Who then shall fall on bended knee? All, all. Every last blessed one, all creatures of our God and King will say, oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Paul said in light of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that God has now highly exalted Him and given the lovely Lord Jesus a name that is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Your tongue will one day confess. Your knee will one day bow. You will submit to the total reign of Jesus Christ the Lord. That's why I said earlier the only question for you, not a question of if, it's a question of when. And that's why I want to say one last time, I wouldn't leave this building today unless I knew for a fact that the one who died on the cross for sin, buried in a borrowed grave, bodily raised from the dead, had taken up residence in my heart, forgiven me my sin and given me the promised hope of heaven when I die. It was in the springtime of 1942. Sit very still. General Douglas MacArthur had received word that he was to evacuate the Philippine Islands. MacArthur was over the Allied theater uh, in in the South Pacific. Japan and the Philippines. Things weren't going well. Roosevelt knew that MacArthur was a valuable leader for the war effort, and so he sent him orders to leave the Philippine Islands and make a way of escape, ultimately to Australia. MacArthur didn't want to leave, but he followed the orders of his commander-in-chief. When he got to Australia, he radioed a message back to to the people who were being held captive on the Philippine Islands, and he said, I want you to know, I made it through safely. Talking about his escape. I made it through safely, and I shall return. Two and a half years later, that's exactly what he did. You say, preacher, was that good news? Well, depends on which side of the battle you were on. And when Jesus returns, whether or not that will be good news or bad news really depends on which side of the battle you're on. I'm going to say it one last time. Because Jesus lives, I wouldn't leave this building today unless I knew for a fact 
He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today because He lives within my heart. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.